Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. Happy Monday. I'm Charlie Sykes. He is Will Salatin. Good morning, Will. How are you? Good morning, Charlie. Well, it is rare, even in in the world that we live in, that we have a news cycle that is as uh, fraught and full as we have right now as we're watching, as the whole world is watching what's going on in, in Europe. Uh, you have these peace talks going on, uh, the possible implosion of the Russian economy, very fierce fighting in some of the cities, including what looks like some severe rocket attacks on civilian populations in some of uh, the Ukrainian cities. Uh, and also just the uh, watching NATO revive itself in rather extraordinary ways. And every, every few minutes you get a, a tweet, you go, I can't believe that that just happened. Switzerland has now chosen sides. I mean, Will, you know, all kinds of things on my dance card. Switzerland saying, yeah, you know, that neutrality thing, we're in. We are all in. So let me start with this, uh, Will. You know, one of the things that pundits like to do, of course, is say, I called this shot. I was right about this. So let's flip that around. What has most surprised you about the last week? What development has been the biggest surprise to you that, that challenged your priors? The biggest surprise for me is that is that the world is doing the right thing. I mean, it's, I know it's, no, it's, it's kind of a silly thing to say, but really like we've gotten so used to things getting worse and worse and nobody doing anything about it. And that's true of so many of the world's problems. And it's true of people's behavior morally. But, you know, there's this line, weirdly, Charlie, that I keep thinking back to now. It's from Donald Trump in 2015, 20, I think it was 2016, when he said, I could walk out in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose right. any voters, right? right? And that that line has like ruled my world for a long time because nobody has done anything. But it turns out that if you walk out in the middle of Kharkiv and start shooting people, like a lot of people, the world cares, right? The world is motivated when you cross a certain threshold of the degree, the amount of evil that you're perpetrating. That seems to be what's happened to some of these European countries that we've long criticized. We've thought they're squishy, the Dutch, the Germans, the Swiss, the Swedish, countries that had no interest in standing up to evil are standing up. They're sending weaponry. Even the Germans who would renounce sending weaponry are sending it. They're it's sending not... jet airplanes. They're sending jets. You know, the Germans had a rule, <laughs> sensibly enough, after you had a Nazi yeah. Reich, not to send military weaponry into a conflict zone. And it turns out that they've finally realized that the evil is on the other side now and that they're willing to do that. So that's really the surprise to me. What about you? No, see, I want to get more specific later, but I want to stick with where you're at because I have the same reaction when you think about it. We draw the distinction between optimism and hope, which I think is valuable. Optimism is just the belief that things are going to get better. Hope is the belief that if we all work together and, and fight and struggle, that maybe the world will become a better place. And I think that we have struggled with hope for a long time. And I think we have been locked in the loop that you described where nothing actually matters. Uh, the, the the lie will always triumph uh, that uh, that the that the, the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passion and intensity, right? And then you, you, you look around the world and you see these massive crowds in Prague and Budapest and Berlin and, and in Spain and in Washington, D.C. And you realize, you know, there is reason for hope that there is this massive constituency for democracy, who, people who do see the difference between good and evil, who are willing to push back against authoritarianism. Because I do think that we have kind of got locked in this belief that, you know, democracy and freedom are in decline and that the authoritarians are on the ascendancy. And now we have this real moment of clarity, don't we? So what is that? I mean, were things just not bad enough? I mean, a lot of bad things have been happening in the world and nobody did anything about them. Is this just so compelling? Is it consuming of media that everyone's now looking at the shelling of Kharkiv or the refugees or the tanks rolling? Something has happened yeah. that just struck people. And I am I am puzzling over it in part because, I mean, I'm desperately hoping that we win this fight. But in addition to it, I'm wondering how the world can be mobilized for for other crises um, where people just didn't pay attention. 
Well, okay, I'm going to flip it around because I think you're right. I think that people were shocked by the horror, by the violence, by the brutality. But the flip side of that is I think people were inspired. I think that people were were watching, and I think a lot of people had the default setting that Vladimir Putin would just roll in, would uh, conquer Ukraine within 24 hours, and that we would move on. And instead, we had these incredibly courageous Ukrainians who were standing up and making it clear that they were going to fight for their country. And and of all the unlikely characters of our century, I mean, seriously, President Zelensky, who's like, you know, meme within a meme within a meme, a guy that played a comedian on television who becomes the president, who then actually becomes the president, and then becomes the most inspiring, courageous leader in the world. I do think that that inspiration, and as people looked around, you know that the Europeans were were kind of you know they were they were they were being Europeans they were going to take half measures they were going to engage in various forms of appeasement or hand waving and yet confronted by this courage and I know it sounds almost cheesy or you know corny I think they looked at one another and said are you in if you're in we'll be in too and you've seen this sort of you know domino effect of people willing to do the right gutsy thing which. Will, it's been a long time since we've seen that kind of shit, you know? It, it absolutely no. has, you know, and, and I, I, you know, back to your theme about hope and despair, you know, I have become a cynic, right? I have sort of come around to the idea that there's virtue, but virtue is wonderful and it would be wonderful if we all behaved virtuously, but that virtue itself accomplishes nothing, right? That's my right. thought. Like the virtuous get steamrolled, they get crushed, they get bulldozed. And what we're seeing now and in particular in the person of Zelensky, is that virtue can be effective, not just effective. I mean, I think this guy's virtue, and it started, look, let's give credit to the people of Ukraine. They're, you know, It wasn't right. just him. People stood up, they fought, they took up weapons. But this guy was offered the usual escape. We'll help you get out of the country. It's an escape that Ashraf Ghani took in Afghanistan. Yeah, the, the right? contrast is pretty stark, isn't it? Extremely run stark. Run away, run away. And that's the norm, right? The norm is the guy leaves because he's right. got friends in the other countries. That will well, and he doesn't out. want to be killed. Right. And this guy says no. Now, and when he says no and he stays and fights, that heartens everyone in the country. He goes out in the street. He takes the videos. And what strikes me from this is that he is a spark and what he illustrates is that courage is contagious, right? Yeah, And when I know. people, there are so many people who are weak. And for God's sake, you and I have watched this in America, right? The weakness, cowardice, those are contagious. But if you turn it around, if someone in the middle of the drama says, I will stand and fight, that inspires other people. There is a spark in each of us which gets lit. And all of a sudden, we have this world on fire, of courage everywhere, people sending weapons. We have foreign fighters coming into Ukraine right now, right? There's a stream of people starting to come in to help the Ukrainians. It's small at the beginning, but those are people putting themselves physically on the line. So what I see is a global wildfire of courage, and I love it. I do too. Now, before we get carried away and you're giving me goosebumps, I think we also need to acknowledge that things could get very, very ugly that it is possible that Vladimir Putin, who has completely miscalculated, whose war has not gone the way that he wanted, will react by being more violent and more brutal, that they will begin dropping hyperbaric weapons on populated cities. These are these massive firebomb types things, leaving aside you know, the whole nuclear question. And so that it is possible that this brief moment, this brief sort of, you know, Kiev spring won't last and, and, and might end in fire and tragedy. And then I guess the question is, what is the hangover after that? Does the inspiration last or will there be disillusionment? Also, I, again, among the things that are very, very surprising to me, the strength of the economic sanctions and our willingness to really destroy the Russian economy, which may blow back on us to a certain extent. And I think this is going to be a test about what Americans are willing to put up with. Are Americans actually going to turn against all of this when their gas prices go up? I mean, I hope that Joe Biden will explain to the country that there is a price to be paid and that the responsibility for the higher gas prices is Vladimir Putin. And because there is a war raging in the heart of Europe, whether he will tell the people that the sacrifice 
or whether or not Americans will kind of revert to our normal, hey, what's in it for me? And the world will go, okay, that was a bad idea. What do you think, Will? Because I'm, I'm trying to game this out a few steps because right now there's lots of reasons for hope and optimism and inspiration. But when Kiev is bombed and bad things happen, it will feel different. Or what? What do you think? I'm yeah. So are, am I being a, a buzzkill? I mean, this, <laughs> this is this is what I do. Will I'm sorry. I, the, you should, we, but we love you for the buzzkill. Yeah, the <laughs> buzzkill is important. <laughs> okay. Okay. So there's a couple of threads in what you said. We, we can talk about the shelling and what's going to happen. You know, if the Russians escalate, which is what I expect to happen. We can also talk about the uh, economic pain that Americans will bear. Let me talk first about the scenario in Ukraine. There's at least three different scenarios that can happen here. One is that Russia wins. Another is that Russia just fails to achieve any of its military objectives and loses and has to go home. A third one is that Russia loses, but the route to losing, the way in which they lose is not that they decide that they've lost and go home, but that they escalate, right? Yeah. And that they do what they're doing in Kharkiv right now. And they do it in Kiev and they do it in other cities. They just ratchet up the murder and they just shell the civilian areas, they pummel the cities, they're trying to get you to surrender, but if you don't surrender, they'll destroy you. And the carnage of that is Ukraine ends up being a loss for Putin, but the damage is so great that it kind of overwhelms the fact that yeah, he lost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there, I do not know what that exactly what that world will look like, a uh, world in which Russia, which holds the Security Council veto, is the number one pariah state and has destroyed another country. I don't know what the consequences look like. I don't know what consequences we can inflict. So that's the first half of your question. But we could talk about that. We can also go to the economic pain if you want. Yeah, no, we can get to that in just a little while. I mean, I, I'm looking at Peter Baker's tweets, though, about the incredible miscalculation of Vladimir Putin. I mean, for all the people who had, you know, Vladimir Putin, you know, incredible, savvy genius, uh, chess player, his miscalculation is, is really extraordinary. I think we're having a hard time catching up with that. They realize how badly this has turned out for him, and therefore that all of our prior analyses of what Putin would do and be capable of doing kind of been thrown out the door. You know, so there's good news and there's some really scary news there. So Peter Baker writes, uh, in almost every way, Putin seems to have achieved the opposite of what he ostensibly wanted. Instead of pushing the U.S. out of Europe, there are more American troops back on the continent. Instead of driving a wedge into the West, he has unified it. Instead of reversing NATO expansion, more countries are now clamoring to join. Instead of demonstrating strength, he has been frustrated so far by a second-tier military and outmaneuvered by a savvy television comic. Okay, that's brutal. <laughs> Instead of cowing Germany, Berlin will increase its defense spending and cut off Nord Stream 2. Speaking of, like, really surprising things. And instead of shoring up his own domestic support, Putin faces protests in the street and deep consternation among elites being crushed by financial sanctions. By the way, I want to throw in the, the anti-war protests in Russia among my really surprising things that are going on here. So this has not gone well for Putin. And so the question is, what does victory look like for him? I'm actually trying to think what a win would look like for Putin at this point, because to win, he has to be incredibly brutal and savage. And then he is stuck with a gigantic country that he has to pacify and the rest of the world armed to the teeth against him. At this point, what does victory look like for Vladimir Putin? I'm not sure what his options are. Yeah, no, I, I don't think he has any good options left. It's a it's a loss reduction strategy at this point. But back to Peter's question, the the, the idea of Putin as you know, we, we we talk about Putin being this fantastic chess player. We have this yeah. sort of idea of the the brilliant Russian chess mind, and he's thinking ahead and all that stuff. This guy made some very very fundamental mistakes. It's not just the logistics. He just did not understand the world. I mean, the first problem for Putin is he went into Ukraine asking the world a question. The question was, how bad do you want it, right? He's, and Putin's wager mm -hmm. was, I want it more than you do. He's talking to the West here. He's like, you, the West, you, the rest of the world, don't care about Ukraine nearly as much as I do. And he had evidence on his side, right? Which was the United States, NATO, we're not going to send in forces. It's not a NATO country. Biden signals, we're not going to fight you militarily. Putin is willing to fight militarily. So Putin wants it more than you do. But Putin forgot the most basic thing, which was the Ukrainians. 
the Ukrainians want their country way, way more than he does, right? Way more than those Russian soldiers who, half of whom seem to have no idea why they're there, seem to have been misled about what they were doing, going to do war games on the border of, of, of Ukraine. So the Ukrainians are fighting like hell. So that was his first miscalculation, understanding that the people in the country, the 40 million people there wanted it way more than he did and would fight for it. The second thing is, Vladimir Putin does not understand virtue, right? He understands extortion. He understands blackmail. He understands coercion. But he does not understand the idea that when people behave virtuously, when they show courage, when they show the will to fight, and when they make a moral case, that other people around the world rally to that. I mean, I think Putin's surprised at the people in his streets, you know, the people who are protesting in Russia, never mind in Georgia and Switzerland and London. So he just wildly underestimated the extent to which people would be mobilized, would be motivated by standing up against evil. And that is the hell he's now living in. I think you're right about this. And I'm looking now for the tweet from uh, Michael McFaul, the former uh, U.S. ambassador to Russia, who's watched him for many, many years. And he says, you know, this is what happens when you get into a bubble, that when you become separated from reality like this, that he misunderstood all of these things. He misunderstood everything that you just described. And so you do wonder how isolated he is, um, what his view of reality is, which, of course, also has the scary element of what he's doing with the nuclear weapons. I, I think that he's just simply sort of rattling people and reminding people. But Tom Nichols has a great piece in The Atlantic that I'd urge people to read, where he's very, very clear-eyed about the danger caused, but also reminds people that this is probably for domestic consumption, and it's sort of the kind of thing that Russia does, which is to mention the fact that they're a nuclear power. But his options for actually doing anything are limited. So let's go to some of the, the sound. You want to go to some of the sound bites uh, of the weekend, uh, Will? Sure. You know, we've been talking about how courage is contagious. And uh, you inspired me to write uh, my newsletter, Day Morning Shots, which opens with Senator Tom Cotton from Arkansas, who is on with George Stephanopoulos. And George is pressing him on Donald Trump's continuing praise for Vladimir Putin. And, you know, this raises the whole questions of accountability. You know, how did we get here? And he pushes him. Well, let's just play a little bit of this because, I mean, spoiler alert, in case you don't know this, Cotton refuses at least four times to criticize or condemn Donald Trump's continuing appeasement and praise for Vladimir Putin, even as the entire world is rallying against his aggression. Let's play the first cut. Why can't you condemn Donald Trump for those comments? George, if you want to know what Donald Trump thinks about Vladimir Putin or any other topic, I'd encourage you to invite him on your show. I don't speak on behalf of other politicians. They can speak for themselves. I speak on behalf of Arkansans, who I talked to this week and who are appalled at what they saw in Ukraine. And they want me right now to fight in Washington to support those brave Ukrainians. You're a senior member of the Republican Party. Donald Trump is the leader of the Republican Party. He said last night again, suggested that he would be running for president. When Fox News asked him if he had a message for Vladimir Putin, he said he has no message. Why can't you condemn that? I feel quite confident <laughs> that if Donald, that if uh, Barack Obama yes. or Joe Biden said something like that, you'd be first in line to criticize him. Again, George, if you want to talk to the former president about his views or his message, you can have him on your show. My message to Vladimir Putin is quite clear. He needs to leave Ukraine. Okay, so to his credit, Stephanopoulos is not done yet. So he's asking again, point being, look, this is the head of your party, Senator Cotton. He wants to be president again. You've left the door open to putting him back into power despite everything that he has done to Ukraine, despite his position on NATO. So let's play the second cut from George Stephanopoulos trying to get Senator Cotton to take a stand. If Donald Trump runs again, can you support him? Oh. George, I'm not worried about this fall's election right now, much less an election oh, two years from now. I'm focused on the naked war of aggression that Vladimir Putin has launched in Ukraine right now. There's not a moment to lose. We can worry about electoral politics down the road. President Trump was, former President Trump was out there talking about it last night. I simply don't understand why you can't condemn his praise of Vladimir Putin. George, again, I don't speak on behalf of other politicians. Huh? They can all speak for themselves. Okay. So first of all, Will, 
George Stephanopoulos does understand why Tom Cotton will not criticize Trump, right? He understands it because he has watched Republicans choke on this question for the last six years. But your thoughts? So explain something to me, Charlie. Explain (laughs) to me how Tom Cotton – okay, there are a lot of people who have done this thing that Cotton just did, right, who refusing to speak up. Tom Cotton is a military veteran. Tom Cotton served in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan. Tom Cotton – won the bronze star. Okay. Explain to me how a man who has demonstrated physical courage in battle can be such an unbelievable coward about his political career, right? He's now in a situation where- I got nothing. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I have not served in war. I respect Senator Cotton's service. He's clearly done way more than I have. And I do not understand why he cannot follow through here when all that is at stake is not his physical body, but whether he might get primaried in what year is he up? I can't even remember. It's it's amazing. It really is amazing. And you know, the, here's the flip side. I was thinking about what you said before, you know, about, you know, how courage can be contagious. Well, I mean, they're still in the midst of this pandemic of cowardice in the Republican Party. But you do wonder if a Tom Cotton said, OK, George, you know what? You're right. This is a moment of choosing. This is a moment of real clarity. And I will tell you that I think the former president's conduct is reprehensible, is unacceptable. And there is no way that he should ever be allowed in the Oval Office. Okay, so he would get shit on by Fox News. There would be the Twitter trolls and everything. But might it be one of those moments where it would be contagious? I maybe say I have this fantasy that somebody stands up and other people look at him and go, okay, you know what? I'd rather be with that guy. And, and whether or not that kind of courage would be contagious, but they're not even willing to test that, which is, I know it's an old story, but it continues to be remarkable. And for just the reasons you said. Yeah. Okay. And I don't want to exaggerate the similarities between an actual war in Europe where people right. are getting killed and political fighting in the United States where the stakes are, you know, serious, but they're not mortal at the moment. It's much easier to speak out than it is to charge into guns. Right. But here is the parallel or the parallel that didn't happen, right? Zelensky stands up and says, I'm going to fight the Ukrainians, say they're going to fight the world rallies to them. In America, in our political fight over democracy, you know, there's right after January 6th, um, you know, Liz Cheney tries to lead the charge and she gets 10 people to go with her to impeach Trump. And she tries to spark courage in her colleagues and in her party. And it doesn't happen. No, it just doesn't happen. And why does it happen one way in one case and the other in the other case? And my default guess, you tell me, the default guess is it just wasn't bad enough, right? People weren't getting killed, right? That if Trump actually walked out and started shooting people, they would stand up to him. There was an attack on the capital of the United States, very serious in terms of institutions, in terms of the future of our country, but not enough people got killed. It's just that simple. It didn't look bad enough. I don't know. I It is interesting because I do worry that we're back in January 7th again, where we feel that this is the big one. There's going to be the break. Well, of course, people are going to step away. And I wrote a long and very cynical piece for Politico magazine where I said, no, they're never going to break with them. It's going to be the same old thing because the entertainment wing of the party is still isolationist. They're still all in with Trump and they're afraid to do it. And as soon as I pressed send on that, I thought maybe that's too cynical. Maybe this will be enough. And then, of course, you wake up yesterday morning and you see Tom Cotton and you go, now we're right back there. We are totally back there. So let's talk about, uh, again, uh, uh, where Vladimir Putin's head is at right now, because, I mean, a lot rides on this. Um, Democratic Senator Mark Warner was on Meet the Press yesterday, and he was asking about Putin functioning as an isolated autocrat. Let's play a short soundbite from Mark Warner. What we do know is that over the last couple of years, Putin has been more and more isolated. He's not been in the Kremlin for the most part. He's been down at his place in Sochi or at his dock outside of, uh, outside of Moscow. And when you are an authoritarian leader and you have less and less inputs and you're only hearing from people that want to say to the boss, hey, you're right, uh, I think that leads to miscalculation. And I think that is what has happened in the case of his invasion in Ukraine. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've kind of covered this, but I, I agree with that. It, of course, then raises the question of what the end game is going to be. Yeah. So what's interesting to me about that comment is Mark Warner, he's not just another senator wanking on TV, right? He's the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. He opens by saying, you know, I'm not going to talk about the intelligence. But then, of course, all these senators, what they tell you then is based on the intelligence. So what he's telling you, you can bet 90 percent, is stuff that he's hearing from the intelligence community. 
which is, you know, we think of them as, oh, they're spies and they're like listening into phone calls and stuff. What a lot of what intelligence people do is this kind of psychological analysis. They're looking at Putin's travels and what they're seeing is this guy is just increasingly socially isolated, which has happened to many of us during COVID, but the rest of us are not running, you know, a nuclear superpower. So what they're seeing is that this guy has fundamentally changed over the last few years. And the problem now, he's not behaving rationally, which is why a lot of people misjudge what he was going to do in Ukraine. And the further problem is he still got thousands of nuclear weapons. Yeah, that's the- So we spent all of this time as America, as the United States Defense Forces, worrying about what crazy guy around the world was going to acquire nuclear weapons and how we could prevent that. What actually happened was that a guy who already had thousands and thousands of nuclear weapons seems to be going a little crazy. And that is, of course, just as serious a problem. And we really do not know to what extent we can trust him at this point not to do something extremely dangerous. Also yesterday morning, uh, Condoleezza Rice, the former Secretary of State, had an appearance on Fox News that uh, generated an awful lot of buzz. Uh, It was not the usual sort of thing that you hear on Fox News. This was uh, Condi Rice yesterday morning talking about Vladimir Putin and maybe his disconnect with the Russian people these days. The United States has always been best in these information wars when we're telling the truth. Not when we're using our own propaganda, but when we're telling the truth. And you have people in Ukraine and a huge population in Russia knows that their government is not telling them the truth. I've been told, you know, the Russian television is playing World War II and Nazis and so forth. But, you know, nobody under the age of 40 in Russia watches television. They're on the Internet. They can see what's happening there. And so he's having a hard time hard... uh, Harder time hiding his crimes than he did even in 2008. Your thoughts, Bill? Well, you know, Vladimir Putin is getting old. Is he 70 yet or just 69? He's right up there. He's at the age when people said Ronald Reagan was old, right? But <laughs> Which was, oh, for it's those all, days. It's all relative these days, you know? <laughs> but the guy is old and the people around him are old, right? And their ideas about how to suppress knowledge, information in their society are old. So they're running all this Nazi stuff on state TV in Russia, right? Because this is supposed to be a denazification campaign in Ukraine, right? That's their cover story. And one of the reasons why it's not working is the young people aren't watching TV, right? And, and so it's just a lot harder with the diffuseness of the internet for an authoritarian to control what his people know. They're rounding up people on the street, right? You go out to protest in Moscow, they pick you up and they put you in a paddy wagon and you're out of there. But in terms of actually preventing Russians from knowing what's going on, he doesn't have the power he used to. Now, I'm not going to pretend that I understand how all of the financial sanctions work, all of the squeeze. People who are much smarter than I am have laid out what possibly is going to happen, including the collapse of the Russian economy and the kind of pain that's going to be inflicted. Uh, the White House Press Secretary, uh, Jen Psaki, was explaining this, or at least trying to uh, lay out how serious these sanctions were. Let's listen to her. The sanctions that we announced yesterday are on par, put Russia on par with Iran, cutting them off off from a banking system with the global community. We have now also sanctioned 80 percent of their banks and their financial sector. This makes it very difficult for President Putin and the Russian government not only to do business, but also to help fund a greater expansion of their military and greater expansion of innovation in their country. So we we have taken uh, severe steps already, but of course there's more we can always consider doing. You know what really strikes me? We started off to asking about the biggest surprise. I think it has been our willingness and the willingness of the Europeans to really go to the mat on all of this, knowing that it will blow back. And again, I can't speculate about what the effect will be on our stock market. I'm guessing there'll be a good deal of volatility on that. So I'm not going to go out on, on a limb. But also the way in which the Biden administration has orchestrated this. I think it's worthwhile giving them some kudos that they let the Europeans kind of take the lead or look like they were taking the lead. But clearly, uh, working behind the scenes, Joe Biden, who you know gets, gets no love at all these days, has really achieved some real diplomatic successes, hasn't he? 
He has, and of course, this brings back an infamous phrase from the old days, leading from behind, right? This was, oh, God. remember, remember yeah. the uh, Republicans attacking Barack Obama, saying that, you know, was mocking him about leading from behind. But this is what leading from behind looks like, right? If you're going to fight an economic war, which is what we're trying to fight, and it's really, really important that we succeed in fighting this economic war because the alternative to economic war is military war and we don't want that right so in order to do that you need the rest of the world the united states i think mitt romney said this weekend he pointed out the united states used to be 40 percent of the world's economy and now it's 20 percent. yeah so we need our allies in order to implement these sanctions to cut off the russians from the international system we need nato and we need the eu and we need you know the australians and the japanese and the canadians and all that and so internationalism, which is precisely the thing that Donald Trump and his party rejected during his time, is exactly the way that you build strength. So the idea of America first is uniquely ill-suited to a world in which you need to fight economic warfare to deter an enemy from launching actual military invasions. So, okay, let's switch gears. I know we should focus almost exclusively on Ukraine, but Bill Barr is out with a book or is shortly going to be out with a book. And apparently it is scathing. Uh, let me just read you the New York Times account. Former Attorney General William Barr writes in a new memoir that former President Donald Trump's, quote, self-indulgence and lack of self-control, unquote, cost him the 2020 election and says, quote, the absurd lengths to which he took his stolen election claim led to the rioting on Capitol Hill. In the book, titled One Damn Thing After Another. Mr. Barr also urges his fellow Republicans to pick someone else as the party's nominee in 2024, calling the prospect of another presidential run by Mr. Trump dismaying. Now, we always debate where we set the bar here, to use the, 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 <laughs> the pun. But at least one of the standards that we've always had is that you had to acknowledge that we can't be in favor of a restoration. And uh, Barr apparently writes, Donald Trump, has shown that he has neither the temperament nor persuasive powers to provide the kind of positive leadership that is needed. And there he is. So I'm kind of holding off on this. I'm putting him in the category of trigger warning here of Chris Christie, where you know I'd have to go on a long extended fuck you rant before <laughs> I'd be willing to to sit down. I mean, you know, did anybody cover up bully or lie for Trump more zealously than Bill Barr? Is anybody more deplorable in what he did to the rule of law and his complicity in the obstruction of justice. And also, why the hell does everybody have to wait till they publish a fucking book to tell America <laughs> the truth? You know what? What is what is that? I mean, is, are they making that much money? Is it that important for them? You know, that you have to wait for the book? It's like, oh, maybe you should have told us this before the election. Maybe you should have told us this stuff when he was being impeached. But no, you wait for the fucking book to come out. So, okay. So, as you can tell, I'm, I'm, I'm withholding my reaction. <laughs> So, all right, Bill Barr. I mean, I'm, my head's in my hands here. Yeah, uh, this guy, this guy, this guy, single-handedly responsible. <laughs> he stabbed Bob Mueller in the back. He buried the mm -hmm. Mueller report. He buried the obstruction of justice. This man, Donald Trump, who Barr says was unfit to be president, he knew then. He knew then. It's not like Donald Trump changed, right? He knew then that Donald Trump was unfit. He had evidence of obstruction of justice in front of him. He spiked that report. He lied about it and he cut it off. Right? We're not going to prosecute the obstruction. So he's more responsible than just about anybody else for Donald Trump serving out the rest of his awful tenure. Having said that, having said that incredibly, <laughs> sorry, I'm going to be the squish again. I believe that the battle for democracy in the United States and to keep Donald Trump out of power and, and his ilk out of power, people who do not believe in democracy and are willing to subvert it is so serious that I will accept all converts, oh including God. Bill Barr, including the people who are doing it to make money on their books. He is telling the truth, even if it's late, he's telling the truth and it matters. <sighs> Boy, I, I I'm struggling with this. I really I really am because I, I I take I take your point because ultimately it is going to take people from who have been on that side 
to come over and say, we're done. I mean, we, we were talking about Tom Cotton, you know, why does Tom Cotton not finally say, okay, George, you're absolutely right. I am done with this. Let's move on because he knows that he's going to get all kinds of shit and he's going to get no love in return. See, that's part of the problem is that, you know, so with, with Bill Barr, but does, okay. I, let's, let's, let's take your argument that we need all of the converts. We need the people who are up close and personal, the former chiefs of staff, the people who had been the secretaries of defense, the people who had been the attorney general. And by the way, there's quite a group of people who right now apparently are willing to say this guy should not be given power anymore. Does that make a difference in the modern Republican Party? Does Bill Barr, despite after all of the water he carried for this guy, after all of the toe licking, after all of the obstruction of justice, does he have any juice at all in MAGA world at all? Is he going to make any difference at all? I hate to draw the parallel yeah. again, but you know, at some point, if you get enough people like Bill Barr speaking out, I mean, I'm looking at what happened around the world on Ukraine when there was an epidemic of gutlessness and suddenly it, it turned around. I'm and sensing it, it, some it, irrational exuberance here. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sorry. I just... So, okay, I will not make a prediction about what will happen. I will simply argue that the mechanism by which these tides turn is just an accumulation. It is, you know, the old idea of a tipping point. You get a Liz Cheney, you get an Adam Kinzinger, you get like, you know, a Peter Meyer, you get a few more, you get a Mark Esper, you get a Bill Barr. Eventually, if enough of these people who, quote, have no juice will speak out, will stand up, you can turn the tide. Because, I, because Charlie, there are so many people who are just behaving out of cowardice. And if they sense that the wind is turning, they will turn with it, right? So that gives me some hope. So, okay, the reason I'm laughing is not because I disagree with you. It's because I have been you for six years, but have been so <laughs> ground, I have been so ground down and so disillusioned. I mean, I was the guy back in the midst of time going, if Paul Ryan would just stand up to him, you know, this is like, if Reince Priebus would, and it's like, oh God, it's over and over and over again. But that hope, I still have that little like little flicker of flame in there, thinking that it could happen. And this is a good analogy. This is why I think Liz Cheney is so important, why Adam Kinzinger is so important. Because even though they're alone, you have to think that there are other people who look at them and go, boy, you know, these guys have guts. I admire that. I'm tired of being a show. You know, I really do have to think, you know, how the world is going to remember me. I find it completely amazing. That more people have not at some point said, you know, when I look back on this 20, 30 years from now, I want to be able to tell my grandkids or my great grandkids which side I was on. It amazes me that people don't do that. But at some point, I don't know what that trigger is going to be. But see, here's the other thing is we've been through this so many times where we go, OK, well, that's it. This is the trigger. I mean, making fun of John McCain for being a POW, it's all over now, right, Will? I mean, <laughs> no. Right. You know, he's twice impeached president, defeated for re-election. Republicans are going to move on now, right? I'm terrified that you're speaking to me from the future, that basically you are the wiser. That no. you've been, as you say, you've been there and that I am expressing it naivete and that over time, I will come around to your point. No, you you are the voice of youthful exuberance and hope, and I am the voice of aged uh, disillusionment and exhaustion. So <laughs> this is the dialogue. It's kind of an eternal dialogue, right? No, but hope, Grandpa. Things can actually get better, you know? And <laughs> Grandpa's, no, it's always going to be shit. Right. Right. Always I, will, I, do take, I do take heart from cowardice. I know that's a bizarre thing to say, but we would be in a much worse world if all of these people – in the Republican Party, believed in Donald Trump. They don't believe in Donald Trump. They no, believe no, no. In, in trying to survive their primary, right? I mean, the politicians. And no, so I'm completely if, with you. You understand that. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's, at least it's not that bad, right? That if there exists the possibility of a change in the political calculus, such that Marco Rubio would put his finger up in the wind and say, oh, okay, now I'm against Trump. Yeah. Don't, don't ever expect an act of courage from Marco Rubio. It won't be him. But it did occur to me as I was watching the various faces of conservatism this weekend, we actually had three conferences at the same time, CPAC, the purely white racist group, which was AFPAC, and then Principles First. Just, just which, so people are clear, there was a comma between CPAC and the purely white racist group, AFPAC. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah. I, I didn't want to, I wanted to kind of allied it there a little bit, uh, but there were three of them. And then, of course, Principles First, which we participated in here in Washington, D.C. And boy, the contrasts were so dramatic that at our conference, you had Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger and uh, former Capitol Police Officer Harry Dunn. You had former Congresswoman Barbara Comstock, serious thinkers about the economy, about foreign policy. And then you had the usual clown, actually, I was going to say the usual clown show of CPAC, but it was much worse than usual. And then, of course, you had the AFPAC, which was is just flat out sort of neo-Nazi racist that Marjorie Taylor Greene went to. It did strike me that in, in a rational world, what you're seeing happen is that the MAGAverse is becoming more and more unhinged and isolated from the mainstream of American life, including the Republican Party, because that was a fucking freak show. But it wasn't freaky enough for the pure racist who've now flipped off. And so there's this kind of sidestep to the really, you know, demented corners of the fever swamp going on out there. And at some point, there is a breaking point because they may continue to dominate Republican primary elections where 20% of the vote can determine the winner. But when you step back and you go, is this where the American people are going? Is this the future of American politics? Because I think sometimes we focus too much on what the percentage of Republicans who believe the big lie are, rather than the fact that 70% of Americans reject a lot of their bullshit. So um, I, I do think that the ongoing crazification of Trump, led by Trump, will have consequences at some point. But it does require that act of courage, which has been vanishingly rare, Will. Yeah, you know, I did not watch all of CPAC, but I went looking. I wanted to see what people had said about Ukraine at CPAC. So I, mm-hmm. I went and searched the transcripts. And the answer is not a heck of a lot. I mean, most of them didn't even talk about Ukraine, right? Here's a war going on. Yeah, you're supposedly conservatives, right? You're an organization that was founded in they part are, to stand up you, to like- not you, not yeah. you. <laughs> right, right, sorry. Yeah. Their heritage is supposed to be anti-communist, mm-hmm. standing up to the evil empire. And so here's the evil empire, the Russian version of it, you know, invading a country and killing people. And they just have nothing to say about it. And what struck me at CPAC was the emptiness the emptiness of this conference. You know, you're talking about stupid little invented culture wars. You're trying to manufacture uh, something to fight about instead of dealing with the obvious thing. And what I wonder is, is the craziness of the Republican Party and of the conservative wing in part a symptom of just having lost its foundations, right? They don't know what they stand for. And I'd argue that the emergence of the racism in the party, that it's increasing prominence, is in part a function of that. You don't have any values anymore, right? You're not standing for democracy. You're not standing for human rights, for freedom. So what are you standing for? You Let's end go up with sort of Yeah, you get this kind of ethnic version of America. like this yeah. way, And it's just that you have nothing better to say. And so you devolve into this turpitude. Okay, so this is an interesting point because I was thinking over the weekend as I was engaging in my own irrational exuberance and looking at the pictures of the world rallying around Ukraine, the pictures of these massive demonstrations in Prague and in Berlin. I mean, these are massive demonstrations. People who are demonstrating and put their their lives and their livelihoods on the line to stand up for freedom and independence for this small, plucky country that's facing fascist aggression – And then I thought about the truckers in Canada. Do they have any idea how ridiculous they look? How absurd it is? They're fighting tyranny and they're fighting for freedom because they don't want to be vaxxed. And this is what the right has devolved to, is these silly little culture wars that we're fighting for freedom because we don't want to be vaxxed. So we're going to have a big, you know, truck thing juxtaposed, split screen with millions of people who are actually fighting against tyranny and freedom. I mean, if there was any shame left in the world, it would be like, this is ridiculous. I'm going to pack up the truck and go home and, you know, turn on CNN or something. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I mean, one of the great ironies of this weekend was Donald Trump speaking at CPAC and starting off talking about, this is a quote from him, the socialists, globalists, Marxists, and communists who are attacking our civilization. Right. That's the quote. And and you're like, okay, he's going to talk about Ukraine. Nope, nope. It's not about Ukraine. 
it's about Canada. It's about Canada. American liberals. It's about like – This is like it, South Park. This is really a South Park episode. It's the <laughs> Canadians. We need to go to war with Canada. We need to liberate Canada. This is a freaking South Park parody. Absolutely. And in fact, he goes, he, he goes after Trudeau. If you watch Fox News these days, there's sort of an obligatory, and here's a minute of news from Ukraine. And then they're launching into this anti-vax, anti-Justin Trudeau, Tucker Carlson tearing his hair out over like terrible violation of human rights in Canada. It is absolutely <laughs> South Park. And I keep waiting for them to pay some kind of a price for this, but their audience seems to love it. Well, I mean, this is the formula I don't think some people on the outside sometimes fully understand is that when reality cuts against them, like it did on January 7th or right now in uh, Ukraine, you know, much of the right-wing ecosystem adapts by strategic silence, by ignoring it, ignoring it, and then changing the subject. That all you need to do is basically you find one person who said something objectionable and you pivot to that. You don't defend the indefensible necessarily. You wait and then change the subject. And they're actually very, very good at this. So watch how that happens. Although... I do think this going after Trudeau while Putin is raping Ukraine was, I would like to think, a teachable moment. But it was, and also to think that if you look at the pictures from CPAC with the golden statue of Trump, it's kind of silly to say, don't you realize how ridiculous you look? Of course you're ridiculous. You go there because you want to be ridiculous. It's been the Star Wars bar scene for decades. So calling them ridiculous is not really a pejorative in their world. No. And so what I'd like to believe is that when serious things happen in the world, like the reemergence of the Russian threat, that that will favor serious politics and that people who spend their time talking about Dr. Seuss and critical race theory will lose out politically because they just don't answer the needs of the moment. But again, <laughs> that's my optimism speaking, Charlie, and I, it, TBD, right? TBD. Will Salatin, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. I appreciate it, as I do every Monday. Thanks, Charlie. And before we end, I want to tell you about something else that I think you will like. If you're a fan of this podcast or any other podcast at The Bulwark, I really think you're going to enjoy the second season of The Focus Group, hosted by our very own Sarah Longwell. Maybe you've heard Sarah talk about these focus groups that she conducts. This season, she's sharing audio from the actual participants to give you an inside listen into how swing state voters are thinking about some of the country's biggest issues when casting their votes in the upcoming primaries in November's general election. It's a great show, and I know you're going to love it. Again, it's called The Focus Group with Sarah Longwell, and you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else where you can consume podcasts. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thanks for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. We'll be back tomorrow, and we will do this all over again. Hey, it's Rich Eisen. And my first guest of season three of Just Getting Started happens to be the new host of this podcast, my better half, Susie Schuster. You've got one of the most unique stories of how you got started. So why don't you come across the hall, take the chair. And, oh boy, wait a minute. I think I, I locked the door. That's not a metaphor for anything. How's the lighting in here? I mean, I'm vain, you know? So I thought for the first season, try to bring you people I thought were diverse and different and maybe interesting and that's why I started off with Jeffrey Ross the comedian and then you know we've got a bunch of other asks out making Paul Rudd do it sorry Paul do you know that you're doing it and I want this to be inspirational life is really hard right now and sometimes you just need a little bit of help someone to reach out their hand and pull you along or to push you from behind and say you can do this and I'm hoping that's what you're going to get from just getting started go follow just getting started wherever you get your favorite shows